His name was called Rehoboam, and he was the fourth king of Israel, and in his day, the nation split. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV, going through the Bible in one year. We're doing it this year from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Today, we're going to read 2 Chronicles chapter 11, all about Rehoboam. It's going to be very interesting, so get ready for that. Corey and Ryan are here. Corey? I'm looking forward to the reign of King Asa in 2 Chronicles chapter 14. Ryan? Well, today we're reading about the transition of leadership from King Saul to King David. And what's really fascinating is that many people from Saul's own tribe of Benjamin joined David. And today I'm going to be looking into the history of this amazing tribe of Israel. Very good. Excellent. Janice? Today, listening and learning. All right. Very good. Open up your Bible. Get your Bible guide. If you don't have one, we'll tell you how to get one. Let's look at what God tells us. Second Chronicles 11, 1 through 12. Now when Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled from the house of Judah and Benjamin 180,000 chosen men who were warriors to fight against Israel, that he might restore the kingdom to Rehoboam. But the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel in Judah and Benjamin, saying, Thus says the Lord, You shall not go up or fight against your brethren. Let every man return to his house, for this thing is from me. Therefore they obeyed the words of the Lord and turned back from attacking Jeroboam. So Rehoboam dwelt in Jerusalem and built cities for defense in Judah. And he built Bethlehem, Etam, Tekoa, Beth Zur, Soko, Adullam, Gath, Merisha, Ziph, Adoraim, Lachish, Azekah, Zorah, Aijalon, and Hebron, which are in Judah and Benjamin, fortified cities. And he fortified the strongholds and put captains in them and stores of food, oil, and wine. Also in every city he put shields and spears and made them very strong, having Judah and Benjamin on his side. Second Chronicles chapter 11, verses 1 through 12. Now, this is interesting because we're going into Second Chronicles and we've finished pretty much with Solomon's life. Now we're going into Solomon's son, Rehoboam. Uh, this gets really interesting and challenging because God splits the kingdom. Really? It's God's kingdom. But the people did not serve God. God's response to Solomon's failure as a king was to split the kingdom. And he did so at the time of Solomon and his death. And his son took over. Now, Jeroboam was an enemy of his father, that is Solomon, and the king, when he was alive, he, they were just going at each other. And when he was alive, he hid out in Egypt, Jeroboam did, until Solomon was dead. Now, Solomon had been taxing the kingdom so much that it devastated the people in the land. Taxes do that. Solomon had given into idolatry through his wives, and he distanced himself from the true king of Israel, that is God. Now, this was a very traumatic time in which Rehoboam, another of Solomon's sons, took control. The Lord moved in and permitted Jeroboam to return from Egypt and to advise Rehoboam to relax the taxes and handle the people with less intensity. Rehoboam did not listen to the advice that he had been given, and he came back with harsher response from his own young counselors. The intensity would increase. There was a revolt against Rehoboam, and the kingdom was split. You see, Rehoboam was determined to fight and to get it back. Oh, he was dedicated to do that. He gets everybody ready and all of that. Now, this is a really interesting time. We're, we're shifting. We've had Saul, we've had David, we've had Solomon. Now Rehoboam, and God splits the kingdom. 
just like that. This is fascinating. So take your Bible guide and turn to today's passage. If you don't have one, write to us or call us. We'll send you one. And remember, it cost us a donation to send it to you, so we appreciate it. Another way you can do that is go to Bible Discovery TV. That's BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And uh, click on the Bible Guide page. It'll take you to a donate page. Thank you for your donations. They mean a lot. And then we go to uh, a page where you can download it exactly how we printed it. So it's very, very interesting. That's very good for people who are overseas. Nevertheless, let's pray. Father, I pray today as I look at these words, that you would help us to hear what you're saying, these 12 verses that we're going to talk about today. And we're going to give what I believe to be what what I think you're saying, but I could be wrong, but help me, Lord, and Holy Spirit, interpret your word through this. In Jesus' name, and we said together, amen. All right. Now let's look at the scripture because it's 2 Chronicles chapter 11. It says, now when Rehoboam, that's the son of Solomon, Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled from the house of Judah and Benjamin 180,000 chosen men who were warriors to fight against Israel, that northern people who rebelled against him, that he might restore the kingdom to Rehoboam. That's what he wanted to do. You see, Rehoboam wanted to kill those who rebelled against him because that's what kings did. Beloved, listen carefully. We must not attack those who resist God's kingdom. I want to leave it up there for a minute. I want to say this again. We must not attack those who resist God's kingdom. God knows what he's doing. God is understanding exactly what's going on. We just need to to tell people to understand this is God's kingdom and we encourage them to get right with God. But we don't attack people when they don't accept our ways or do what we say. That's not right. We, We simply encourage them to do what's right. It becomes important. Now, what's right, by the way, keeps them from going bad in the end of life. That's important. All right, so let's read on. But the word of the Lord came to Shammah, the man of God, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, the king of Judah. Speak to him. And to all of Israel and Judah and Benjamin, saying, Thus says the Lord, You shall not go up or fight against your brethren. Let every man return to his house. For this thing is from me. Therefore, they obeyed the words of the Lord and they turned back from attacking Jeroboam. This is stunning. Rehoboam was challenged to stop the civil war by a prophet sent by God. And there are times when fighting may feel right, but it's not. Fighting may feel right. Oh, that's the right thing to do. They need to get right with God. Let's just go in there and take it over. Hold on a minute. People are going to make their choices. God knows that. God said that he's empowered everyone with a choice. They will make their choices about who they believe. I'm not talking about freedom of speech or any of that. I'm talking about who they believe is God. Who do you believe God is? Interesting, isn't it? Who do I believe God is? I believe God is the Lord. He's the one in heaven who dictates everything. And so I have to check with him on everything. And when I pray, that's what I do in the morning. That's very important. Let's read the last couple of verses here as we focus on this. So Rehoboam dwelt in Jerusalem and built cities for defense in Judah. And he built Bethlehem, Etam, Teoka, Beth Zur, Sokah. Adullam, Gah, Merishah, Ziph, Adoram, Lachish, Azka, Zora, Ajalan, and Hebron, which are in Judah and Benjamin, fortified cities. And he fortified the strongholds, and he put captains in them, and stores of food, oil, and wine. Also, in every city, he put shields and spears. And made them very strong, having Judah and Benjamin on his side. Now, this is important. 
I, I need to say this. Rehoboam wisely chooses to follow the words of the Lord spoken by the prophet. The words of the Lord spoken by the prophet. Beloved, we should follow the word of God, not what seems right to us. There's a lot of people today. And they're saying, well, the word of the Lord is this. The word of the Lord is that. And the word, I believe it's this, I believe. Forget it. Here's the word of the Lord. It's called the Holy Bible. There it is. That's what you read. Everybody's got their latest version of what's going on. Then there's the real reason and the real purpose of what's going on in the word of God. Beloved, that's what we need to do. Strive and pray to the Holy Spirit to help us to understand his word. And then that's what we need to do. We need to do what his word says and understand what God is doing so that we can be followers of Jesus Christ. Very important. Father, I pray today that you would speak to our hearts, that we would know you and that we would understand what you're doing. Lord, there, there's so many things we can do, but help us to every day take time to read your word and listen to what you tell us because things are going down and we need to hear what you're doing so we can follow you. In the name of Jesus Christ, and we all, everyone, everyone who believes this said together, Amen, make it so. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ today that we would not be sidetracked by our own ideas, but we would be directed by your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come into our hearts, come into our life today, and teach us your way and show us your path as we look at Zechariah and learn about the future. Help us to hear what you're saying in the name of Jesus Christ. And we said together, amen and amen. All right, so today I want to focus in on 2 Chronicles chapter 14. So we have here the reign of King Asa. Now, Asa is a good king. He starts out his reign as a, as a pretty great king because he begins religious reforms. He has 10 years of rest, uh, 10 years of peace, uh, which seemingly was hard won by his father, Abijah, uh, who only reigned for three years. I, and, and I'm going to say sadly, because I think Abijah sounds like a pretty good king. He sounds pretty good. But but Asa, we're focusing on Asa, he goes throughout the land and he begins some religious reforms. And verse three of chapter 14 says, he took away the foreign altars and the high places and broke down the pillars and cut down the ashram and commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers and to keep the law and the commandment. So I wanna pop a segment in here talking about what the ashram were uh, or what they might've been. Take a look. The word Asherah and its plural Asherim are in the Bible many times in reference to worship practices that were forbidden to the Israelites. While one of the traditional interpretations of Asherah, Asherim, is as a pagan goddess, the Bible's usage of the word isn't always as straightforward. Sometimes the Bible's usage does seem to indicate a goddess. In 1 Kings 18, the prophet Elijah refers to 450 prophets of the known pagan god Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. Also, idols and graven images of Asherah are mentioned. However, in other biblical references, the word Asherah is presented as a tree, a tree trunk, or a wooden pole. And in many cases, the plural Asherim is used. In the ancient Jewish Mishnah, three kinds of Asherah are mentioned, a tree, a tree trunk cut and trimmed, and an idol. The concept of a goddess associated with a tree is very well attested to in the ancient Near East. The goddess that most scholars identify as the precursor to Asherah is an early Canaanite goddess whose names are linguistically connected to Asherah and who was seen as the mother of the gods. She was revered as the god of the home and love and was the spouse of the chief god El, who was eventually replaced by Baal. Asherah is linked to Baal in the Bible. The older goddess's symbol was the sacred tree flanked by two animals or humans who were reaching up to eat the tree's fruit. While there are no mentions of Asherah in Canaanite literature, the Bible's picture of a goddess and trees and wooden poles line up with this earlier goddess's description. It seems Asherah was a goddess and her symbol was the tree. 
Disturbingly, though it was forbidden, the worship of Asherah in Israel and Judah seems to have flourished. Several inscriptions have been found that contain a blessing formula to bring prosperity by God and his Asherah. These formulas date to just before the time of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Putting into context for us the challenge he faced in attempting to rally the nation back to a biblical method of worship. So there we go, just one element of what was considered idolatrous worship in the Bible. Well, that's absolutely fascinating, Corey. Thank you very much. Uh, Ryan. All right, well, our reading today is all about kings, and so I do want to go back today to Israel's first king named Saul and look at the transition to King David. Now, what's really interesting is all the Benjamites that joined David. Now, this is really significant because King Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin, but a lot of them chose to side with David here. So let's take a good look at the origin and the history of this tribe of amazing warriors. Though the birthing Rachel, in her dying breath, named her newborn son Benoni, meaning son of my sorrow, his father Jacob renamed him Benjamin, meaning son of my right hand. He was the youngest of Jacob's twelve sons, and like his brothers, became the father of the Israelite tribe bearing his name. In fact, it would be several years later when his father Jacob, now on his deathbed, proclaimed upon his sons the customary blessing. Though this was much more than the typical patriarchal blessing. It was a prophecy that would develop over the course of the history of the twelve tribes. Benjamin is no exception. In Genesis chapter 49, verse 27, Jacob declares, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. The emphasis on Benjamin is his warlike character, and the tribe of Benjamin fulfilled Jacob's prophecy by becoming extremely skilled warriors. In fact, says one historian, they were skilled archers and slingers, said to be able to shoot at a hair and never miss. They also trained their warriors to be ambidextrous in combat, and in fact, biblical accounts have a few stories of Benjamite warriors catching an opponent off guard by fighting with their left hands. The Benjamite warriors were indeed as fierce as ravenous wolves, and adopted that animal as the symbol of their tribe. The tribe of Benjamin did in fact produce some rather famous warriors, such as the judge Ehud, a left-handed man, as well as the very first king of the Jews, Saul, and his son Jonathan, who was a courageous military commander. Both Mordecai and Esther were Benjamites, as well as Paul the Apostle. Unfortunately, just as Jacob predicted, the Benjamites could also be ruthless, vicious, and cruel, as can be seen in the closing chapters of the Book of Judges. After Benjamites in the town of Gibeah rape a Levite's concubine, the tribe is nearly wiped out by the eleven other tribes. Hence King Saul's later statement that the tribe of Benjamin was smallest of the tribes was quite true. Nevertheless, a close alliance was formed between this tribe and that of Judah in the time of David, which continued after his death. After the exile, these two tribes formed the great body of the Jewish nation. And Benjamin's strong relationship with his brothers, Joseph and Judah, was also maintained by their tribes. Without a shadow of a doubt, David would have been proud to have these Benjamites as a part of his mighty men. They were a force to be reckoned with, that's for sure. As you can see, Jacob's prophecy in Genesis chapter 49 was fulfilled right to the letter. Benjamin most certainly became a ravenous wolf. Yeah, it's really interesting because that, that of course, is where Paul was from in the New Testament mm -hmm. about a thousand years later. And uh, it's, it's absolutely fascinating because you can see this, the idea of the Benjamites being stern people. Paul was that way, you know, Saul, formerly Saul. And uh, just very interesting. Thank you, Ryan. I did a, a series of six sermons from the book of Zechariah, the first half of Zechariah, well, more than half, but or less than half, but the first half of Zechariah. I did them for you. So if you would like these sermons, and uh, we didn't do them anywhere else, we just did them for you, because we're in some interesting times right now. If you want to find out more about these six sermons, then go to our website at BibleDiscoveryTV.com, BibleDiscoveryTV.com, and you'll find it there. As well, you can call us or in Canada, or you can call us in the United States and get a hold of them. I think it's very, very important, but I really enjoyed doing them. I'm going to finish the last half of Zechariah, but right now I got to get these first six out there so you can make some 
interesting thoughts on that uh, when you look at it. And so my encouragement to you is to get a hold of those. Okay, Janice? Well, listening and learning, Rod, it's what we were, I'm talking about today from Second Chronicles chapter 11. And we see here that Rehoboam is getting ready for a fight. He's getting ready for a fight. And we see here, speak to Rehoboam, the Lord says, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel and Judah and Benjamin saying this, this is what God was saying. Thus says the Lord, you shall not go up or fight against your brethren. Let every man return to his house for this thing is from me. And the very next sentence says, therefore they obeyed the words of the Lord and turned back from attacking Jeroboam. I know in your teaching today, Rod, you you touched a lot upon our the attitudes that we have and um, giving our hearts and our minds to what God directs. But in order to be able to do that, we have to actually do that. We have to listen, we have to learn, we have to obey and follow the Lord. And, and you know, Rod, it is a process. Uh, you know, I think of my, my own personality is one that always is a challenge. It challenges, right? And especially as a young person, when we're young, we tend to think that we know everything and that we already know. We say something and, well, I know that. And, you you know, parent gets part sentences out and the child is already saying, I know, I know, I know. So sometimes, you know, it's a, a, it's a process. It's um, a difficult one, maybe not so difficult for some as it is for others, but to learn and to learn in that trust in God and the person of God, in the character of God, that he is God and that he is all authority and that we can depend upon that. And, you know, I, I, as the older that I'm getting, the more I realize how much I don't know. And in my relationship, in my daily walk with God, I have learned that I can depend on God. I have learned that I can take my feelings and my emotions and the things that I think are right or that I think I should do and really bring it to God. What a privilege that is that we can do that to the creator of the universe, this God, this relational God who wants a relationship with us as our father and he will give us direction you know it's it's interesting too how gracious rod and how patient he is with us as his children when he allows us to make the wrong choice and we bear the consequence of that he is so gracious in that and and there are times as we you know, as we bring up our own children, we can teach them, we can guide them. But the truth is, and you know that as a parent, just living in this world, you can see this, that as much as we can teach and as much as we can say and show, sometimes we make the wrong choice. We make the wrong decision and we do have to pay those consequences. But in those consequences, in those moments, they're teachable moments. And God is so gracious and so merciful that sometimes when we do push our own way, he doesn't just say, okay, well, done with you. He's still there because he knows our hearts. And as we're going through these scriptures, you know, we've seen all of the errors that David has made. Can you imagine if your life or my life were written in this book for all to see and read. And it's very easy for us, isn't it, guys, Mm -hmm. to be very judgmental of this. But the truth is, it's God who's gracious. It's God who's merciful. He's perfect. And his ways are best. And it's really good for us to, to see that. He said to them, you shall not go up or fight against your brethren. Rehoboam thought he was doing the right thing. But they listened to God, and that changed the course of of action. You see other times where God has said, don't do that. Mm -hmm. You see his own children, Israel, rebel. And he would even be gracious enough to say, when this happens, if you return to me, I will return to you. That's the thing. That's the thing. How many times, and, and you could say this too, we thought we knew what we were doing. 
when God called us to start a church, man, I was ready and I knew what we were doing. And I got into it about six months and I was realizing I don't know anything. How people can get in trouble, how things are, how I couldn't make decisions because there were so many possibilities. And I realized God knows all of this. Mm -hmm. The teachable moments, teachable which you moments. mentioned, are very, very important. And there's people listening right now. You're in a teachable moment. You're in a moment when God's trying to teach you something. I know because oftentimes I'm in teachable moments too. Listen to the Lord. Praying is not just barking out to God what's wrong. But praying is actually listening to the Lord. The word says, blessed is the man who meditates on the word of God, thinks about it, puts it in his heart. Take the word of God and meditate on it. Say, Lord, help me to understand this. And in this teachable moment, Lord, I pray that you would teach us and most importantly, help us to listen. I did sermons, six sermons on the book of Zechariah. We're going to do more, but they are for you. And if you want to find out about them, all of that, go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com or call us or write to us and we'll send you that information on how to get those. Very, very important. Today, we need to pray. Lord, I pray to you today in repentance. <laughs> Help me to live rightly before you every day of my life in the name of Jesus Christ. And I said together, we all said together, amen.